Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to the center this evening. Um, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of you, and particularly to anyone who is here at the center for the first time. I'm Frank Clooney. I'm the director of the center. I'm always uh, glad to welcome you here or welcome you back, as in the case of most of you. Um, we like to have this as a, a casual and relaxed environment. So if you're inclined to get something more to eat or drink while we're talking, please uh, get up. We'll have conversation, question and answer, and definitely finish by 7 p.m. So if you know your time schedule, if you have to leave somewhere along the way, um, please feel free to go. This particular event is part of uh, one of the, the, my favorite and most enjoyable uh, series of the center, new faculty books. And many of you I know have been to these events in the past. We have a chance to hear authors talk about how they came to write the book, uh, what they were intending to do, maybe some of the ups and downs along the way, and then to hear two um, respondents, discussants, to talk about the book, tease out some of the issues, and then open it up for everyone to hear. Um, so uh, two weeks from now, on December 3rd, Ahmed Raghab, we have a, an event on his book, The Medieval Islamic Hospital. And then in the second semester, uh, Giovanni Bazana, Aisha Belesu de Jesus, and Gianna Giazzo will have further book events, so stay tuned for those events to come. But tonight we're very happy to have a discussion of a book that I'll, I'll pass around once we get started, Cormac McCarthy and the Signs of Sacrament, Liturgy, Liturgy Theology, and the Moral of Stories by Matthew Potts, one of our distinguished faculty member here at the Divinity School. Uh, I'll introduce Matthew first, although he needs no introduction, and then um, when it comes time for the respondents, I'll introduce them. So Matt is assistant professor here of ministry studies. Uh, he has a BA from Notre Dame, an MDiv, and PhD here from Harvard University. He joined the faculty in 2013, and his specialties include theology and the practices of Christian communities with a focus on the relationship among narrative, liturgy, and ethics. In particular, he seeks to analyze and interpret Christian sacramental practices while employing the resources of liturgy, literary theory, and Christian theology. Uh, we'll talk about this book in a moment. His next book project, which is already underway, examines theories of sacrifice in postmodernity alongside Christian understandings of the atonement and recent American fiction. Other interests include theologies of revelation, theologies, uh, theories of narrative, the ethics of forgiveness and reconciliation, contemporary Anglican theology, and preaching. I'm happy to add, too, that Matt and I are working on a colloquium in the spring on um, sacramental presence in four different religious traditions. We invite a group of scholars in, so we're, we're already planning, well into the planning for that event in a few months from now. Uh, Matt is also a priest of the Episcopal Church and has served at a number of parishes here in Massachusetts. Um, this book, um, Cormac McCarthy and the Signs of Sacrament, uncovers in contemporary fiction a moral framework that is deeply indebted to the traditions of Christian sacramental theology. You can read them for yourself, but I can't resist um, pointing to several of the comments on the back cover. Uh, Rick Rosengart um, from the University of Chicago uh, praises the book um, as it will uh, for a long time remain the best treatment we have of McCarthy as proto-postmodern theologian. Um, this reading, this book, recuperates the category of story for postmodernity. But then the other comment from David Jasper is a bit more uh, ominous. Um, <laughs> and I want to, any um, and people who are timid, you may want to leave now. Matthew Potts' book is sometimes as dark and haunting as McCarthy's novels themselves. <laughs> it is a comple complex meditation through close reading of the books and their characters contained within careful readings of Nietzsche, Arendt, Adorno, Auerbach, Judith Butler, and others, and so on. So an intriguing book, a wonderful topic, and a great person to talk to about. So let's welcome Matthew Potts. Thank you, Frank, and thank you all for being here. And thanks especially to Professors Hollywood and Rambo uh, for being here tonight. Uh, I have to say I'm uh, sort of pleasantly surprised by all of you being here. <laughs> um, and I, I trust it's because you love Cormac McCarthy. Uh, I hope it's that reason, because he's great, and if you don't, you should, you should read him. Um, you know, Frank told me not to try to dig too, too deep into the details of the argument of the book, to talk more about 
how I came to write it and why I came to write it. And there's sort of a short version of that story and a longer version of that story. And the short version is so short, you'll get both. Uh, <laughs> the short answer to why I wrote this book is that I had a, a dissertation to write. And I could not muster the enthusiasm after six years of graduate school <laughs> to write about anything else. And so I, I wrote about this. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I actually have a long history with Cormac McCarthy in a sophomore um, kind of uh, humanities core course at Notre Dame. I had a professor who took the required curriculum and threw it, like the first day of class, he threw it in the garbage. And he pulled out a bunch of other books and he said, we're going to read these instead. And one of the books he had us read was a novel by McCarthy called Suchery, uh, which came out in 1979, I think. Um, and it's, I remember it's like a 600-page book, and he had, it, had us read it in one week. And I remember staying up all night trying to read it and not really understanding it but knowing that I, I liked it, right? Um, so much so that I actually, when I was in the Navy after college, and I, I, I carried it around the ship with me. I don't know why. I carried this book around the, the ship with me, which I think everyone thought it was weird. Uh, <laughs> in, fact, in fact, they told me it was weird, but I did it. Um, but I was always, always just more of an enthusiast. I, I was in a PhD program in English before I came here for my MDiv, and, and then I thought I might study McCarthy through sort of post-colonial uh, angles and ask questions about race and border issues in McCarthy because he was writing these westerns and that's what I was most interested in at the time. Um, but then I came here and sort of left that behind. I was just a I was just a, a fan of of his writing, and I entered the PhD program here with somewhat different aims. I thought I would write a book on forgiveness, um, or I, I I was shifting at the time. Like a couple years into my program, I was thinking I might write sort of a more down the line theology monograph on Bonhoeffer. Um, and two things happened. The first is that, I think this was two years into my PhD program, I, was, I ran into to Dean Bill Graham, the former dean, outside of Jewett House. And I had had him as both a master's student and in classes as a doctoral student. And he was like, getting into a car or something. He was in a hurry and I was in a hurry and I just ran into him and he asked me how my work was going and what I was working on. Um, and I told him and he, you know, he, was, he, was, he was Dean Graham, he was kind and, and uh, uh, supportive. Um, but then as I was walking away, he said, he said, Matt, don't stop writing about literature. Just don't stop writing about literature. And I think that planted a little bug in my head because the next thing that happened is Ron, my advisor at the time, asked me to, to compile an annotated bibliography on all these things about forgiveness. And it was, it was just an overwhelming project that I, I, I just didn't have interest in it. You know, I seemed exhausted by it. And I remember walking down Francis Street, right down here to class or something one day, and just thinking, I wish I could just write a book about Cormac McCarthy. And then I thought, well, why can't I? And I went and asked Amy and Ron why I couldn't. And they said, there's no reason why you can't. So, so I did. Um, so that's how I came to write it. The, the argument of the book, and I'll just, I'll just speak about this um, briefly. Um, there are two, two attributes of McCarthy's novels that most readers of him agree upon. Right. Uh, the first is that he acknowledges this, this, or he writes about this sort of metaphysical collapse, and he asks moral questions in light of this metaphysical collapse. Um, but the second thing is that images of sacrament are everywhere. They're all over the novels, most of the novels, even, even some of the ones where it's less prominent. If you look too hard, like I tend to, uh, you can see images of sacrament everywhere. And, and the argument of the book, basically, is that those two facts that McCarthy is asking moral questions in light of metaphysical collapse, and uh, the, the recurrence of these images of sacrament, that these two things can and do speak intelligibly to one another. So just, just a word about how I'm thinking about those things or why I'm putting those things together. Um, so the first is this idea of sacraments, right, and sacramental theology. There's, there's a tradition of sacramental theology that talks about the sacraments as signs, right? And one of the attributes of signs is that signs are signs of what they are not, right? The, the sign indicates it is, it indicates it gestures towards something else. It is not itself the thing that it gestures towards. Um, but, but in Christian theology, especially coming out of this Augustinian tradition, um, the sacramental sign has this unique attribute in that it, it is what it indicates, that these sacramental signs are what they mean. They do what they say. They, they don't just refer. They actually realize the reality to which they refer. And, and because they realize the reality to which they refer, there's, there's, it, bec it becomes difficult or, or um, complicated to, to 
maintain too easy a distinction between the transcendent and the imminent, right? The holy is not out there somewhere else waiting to be arrived at. It's in the here and now, right in front of us. And we can actually see this with sort of sacramental practices in, in communities. Frank talked about that. I studied this as well, right? That the, what, what a priest does at the altar at a church which has a communion service, that what is consecrated there is not said to be like to merely refer to some holiness or reality elsewhere. It actually realizes that reality right there. But then you can also extend that metaphor. So if you take communion to someone in a prison or a hospital, it doesn't look anything like what happens in the church, right? But that, that doesn't just refer to what happens in the church. Just like what happens in the church doesn't just refer to what happens in heaven or wherever I want to talk about it, right? All those things are, are real. They fully realize what they, what they refer to. So that's the, in very, in very brief, one of the ways I'm thinking about sacraments. And then, so, so what about McCarthy? So McCarthy just writes about death all the time, <laughs> right? I mean, he's every, and actually, in fact, in one of the few interviews he gave, the first interview he gave, um, the interviewer asked him why he um, wrote so much about death, and he said, because there's nothing else worth writing about. Um, and it's not just that he writes, like he describes death, although he does that in great and graphic detail in his novels. He, he, he describes death and describes it quite violently. But he's also doing it with more, he's describing death with also existential questions, right? If it all ends in death, which is sort of his claim, then what does it all mean? What's it all amount to, he's saying? If it, this is where it all ends, if it all ends in oblivion, if we're all pointed towards this thing, towards this nothingness, then what is the meaning of anything we do prior to that? Um, and we can see this in his novels as well. So those of you who are familiar with The Road, if you've read The Road, right? This, the, the man and the boy are walking to the ocean and they really want to get to the ocean. And they're not really sure why they want to get to the ocean, they just know they want to get to the sea. There's something in the sea that's calling them. And when they get there, it's just the same stuff they've always seen, right? It's just as empty and hollow or whatever as everything else that they were uh, experiencing. And the, the question that's raised is if, you know, if, if this is what we arrive at at the end, this oblivion, then what, what's the meaning? Is there meaningfulness? Can it be meaningful? But what's really wild to me about all these, like this, this kind of relentless, unremitting sort of fixation upon death and oblivion and nothingness that, that happens so much in McCarthy's fiction is that all this is everywhere adorned with images of sacrament. When he's talking about these things, there's sacramental images everywhere, mostly to do with Eucharist, but also baptism and also reconciliation and also matrimony, marriage at times. Um, and you, one, might, one might read this, this adornment, the sacramental adornment, as sort of him gesturing towards the hollowness of these symbols or the uselessness of these symbols. But that's not the way I, <laughs> I read it. Or at least I read hollowness, that hollowness differently, or that emptiness differently. The way I want to read what he's doing with this is that I think he's trying to apply this sort of sacramental logic to, to this, this journey down the road, right? Um, if the value of sacramental signs, for example, is not in what they refer to far away in another world, but in themselves, I think he's also saying that the value of acts, acts of love, acts of care, moral acts, don't have value because they, are, they have referential they serve a referential function. They don't, they don't merely refer to some goodness outside the world. They have value in and of themselves. They realize that value uh, in and of themselves. Um, they don't refer to some deeper reality or some deeper value. They are real value. I mean, the sort of Hallmark card version of this thesis would be something like, life is a journey, not a destination, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, was th I thought of that today, and I was like, oh, man, that's just not very profound. <laughs> but I guess... <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think that's sort of, I think that is sort of the argument he's making about this journey down the road. The value of it is if, if uh, this, this existential problem is not only a problem, but it's a, an especially bad problem if the value of what we do in this life is only what it achieves at the end. Because McCarthy's convinced that at the end it's just lights out. Um, what I think he's trying to say is, and ironically using this Christian tradition, is, is to say, there is a way to articulate value, even if it is lights out. There's a way to articulate some value in the here and now, some holiness in the here and now um, through the use of these images. So I, I really have two aims in this, in this book. One is to complicate readings of McCarthy, and the other is to assert a theology of the sacraments that I think is really faithful to the Christian tradition, even if at times it makes 
more claim, claims that are more radical than, than the tr Christian tradition sometimes wants to make. Um, in other words, I, I hope to use sacramental theology to suggest to certain readers of McCarthy um, that these texts are more religious than they may appear. But I also hope to suggest to certain readers of theology that the sacraments are less religious <laughs> than they appear. And if there was a challenge in writing this book, and there were a lot of challenges in writing this book, honestly, but if there was a challenge in writing this book, it was trying to speak to both that imagined literary critic and that imagined theologian in a way that was both uh, cogent and persuasive to each of them, to try to create a space or create a conversation between them that each would find um, interesting and, um, and persuasive. And, and to be honest, I'm not sh I hope I've done it. Um, I invited a literary critic to be here tonight, and that person didn't come, so I don't know what that, <laughs> that means. And, and, and my publisher, Bloomsbury, lists this book under literary studies, um, and uh, only secondarily under religion. So I don't, I don't know if I've actually created that space. Um, I hope that I have. Uh, but I, if it, even if I haven't created it sort of outside of my head, <laughs> I, the, the, the greatest gift of this book, kind of moving forward from it, and as I look to future projects, as I try now to write that book about forgiveness that I was trying to write before, um, is that I have, I feel like I have created some space in my head um, which can speak intelligibly to both that literary, the literary critic in me and the theologian in me, and, and hopefully provide some sort of, um, some sort of writing which, which opens a space between these disciplines and blurs those boundaries in the same way that I think the theology of sacraments blurs, blurs these, these boundaries and divisions. So uh, I guess that's all I have to say until others have questions. Thank you. So the format of our events is that two uh, persons, scholars familiar with the book um, will open it up. They're not tasked with giving a book review or summarizing the content, but rather kind of opening up the issues. So our first respondent, uh, Amy Hollywood, is the Elizabeth H. Munrad Professor of Christian Studies here at the Divinity School. Uh, she came to Harvard in 2005 when I did, um, after teaching at Rhodes College, Dartmouth College, and the University of Chicago. She's also kind enough at the moment to be chair of the Committee of the Study of Religion in FAS. And, um, somehow had time to be here as well tonight. <laughs> she's, the, uh, she's a prolific author, uh, including these books, 1995, The Soul as Virgin Wife, MacTilda of Magdeburg, Marguerite Poret, and Meister Eckhart, 2002, Sensible Ecstasy, Mysticism, Sexual Difference, and the Demands of History. Uh, 2012, she's co-editor with Patricia Beckman of the Cambridge Companion to Christian Mysticism, and forthcoming, I looked it up online, March 2016. We'll discuss the book next year this time. Um, from Columbia University Press, Acute Melancholia and Other Essays. Uh, she is currently exploring the place of the mystical, often redescribed as enthusiasm, within modern philosophy, theology, and poetry. So let us welcome Amy. I don't know if I'm still doing that. I think I might be taking my advice from uh, Matt uh, Potts and writing a book about Henry James um, <laughs> that I've been wanting to write for a long time, but didn't know I was. Um, um, okay, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, go off script a little bit. So I was rereading. I was reading the book. I had I have read the dissertation on which this book was based, um, uh, and I had not read the book between the hardcovers. And I was rereading it this weekend, and um, and and I reread all but the last twenty pages of the road. Um, I, Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> one of those one of those spousal arguments about when the light goes out and sleeping can happen. Uh, and I was like, I was like, I gotta finish. I mean, I gotta read these like. And, and he's like, Rawr. okay, fine. Um, and, and, and I didn't have time today because uh, anyway, okay. Um, so today is today is the <laughs> really um, uh, 29 years ago today. Um, my father died. Um, November 15th, uh, uh, which is yesterday, uh, uh, 20 years ago my oldest brother died and two years ago my second oldest brother died. Um, so it was a very peculiar experience reading Matt's book and reading The Road um, in that context. I'm just going to read a couple passages from McCarthy, um, who I've been reading for a, a very long time. 
Um, uh, I've been reading McCarthy um, since before these books with their, I would argue, somewhat more hopeful narrative than the early books appeared. Matt's smiling, he knows where I'm going. Okay, um, so, so this is from um, the, the Crossing. Uh, Boyd was your brother, the woman says to this man. Yes, he's been dead many a year. You still miss him, though? Yes, I do, all the time. Was he the younger? He was, by two years. I see. He was the best. We went off to Mexico together when we were kids, when our folks died. We went down there to see about getting back some horses they'd stole. We was just kids. He was awful good with horses. He, I always liked to watch him ride, liked to watch him around horses. I'd give about anything to see him one more time. You will. I hope you're right. You sure you don't want a glass of water? And then from the road, um, I think I was forced to turn the light off right about now. Um, the father and the man and the boy are talking to each other as the man is dying. The, the, uh, the, the boy who has throughout the book um, wanted to die, he's wanted to go with his mother who died, has repeatedly asked to die, um, says to his dying father, I want to be with you. You can't. Please, you can't. You have to carry the fire. I don't know how to. Yes, you do. Is it real, the fire? Yes, it is. Where is it? I don't know where it is. Yes, you do. It's inside you. It's always there. I can see it. Just take me with you, please. I can't. Please, Papa. I can't. I can't hold my son dead in my arms. I thought I could, but I can't. You said you would never leave me. I know, I'm sorry. You have my whole heart. You always did. You're the best guy. You always were. If I'm not here, you can still talk to me. You can talk to me and I'll talk to you. You'll see. Will I hear you? Yes, you will. You have to make it like, that you, you have to make it like talk that you imagine and you'll hear me. You have to practice. Just don't give up, okay? Okay. And then the penultimate section, piece of the novel. The boy has, uh, his father has died and he's been taken up by a man and a woman who have been following them for a while, see that the boy's alone and come and get him. The woman, when she saw the boy, put her arms around him and held him. Oh, she said, I'm so glad to see you. She would talk to him sometimes about God. He tried to talk to God, but the best thing was to talk to his father. And he did talk to him, and he didn't forget. The woman said that was all right. She said that the breath of God was his breath, yet. I don't know how to parse this sentence. She said that the breath of God was his breath, yet, though it passed from man to man through all time. OK. So um, I'm interested in two things in, about Matt's book um, that I want to talk about uh, just really quickly and pose a question. Um, the first is uh, sparked by a citation from Sutri. Um, uh, I won't go into the context of it, it's too long. Um, but uh, Sutri, somebody's ranting and they use the phrase, you and your orthopedic moralizing. <laughs> so, which I know, orthopedic moralizing. Think about how much of that we do, orthopedic moralizing. Um, so, so, so one question um, that has to do with the, uh, this is, this is totally unfair, Matt. I'm sorry, but I'm going to just ask it. One question has to do with the whole issue about the scholarship on McCarthy and why it is that everybody needs to moralize him. Everybody wants there to be a moral Cormac McCarthy. And is it because we need to justify the fact that we're reading these horrific books? I mean, you know, depending on when you start in on, the, on, the, on reading McCarthy, I mean, the first books, Child of Outer God, Darkness, Sutri, we used to have one made-up name for all of them, um, you know, they, they, they are unrelenting. Nothing good happens in these books. Babies are fried over fires. Children are, you know, raped and eaten. Uh, people are murdered in numbers that, you know, pass um, the possibility of imagination. Somebody sent um, Dennis Hopper a copy of Blood Meridian years and years ago saying, you're the only person who can make this into a movie and it needs to be a movie. And Dennis Hopper said, 
I, this is, I can't make this into a movie, <laughs> all right? So that's how, cra you know, that's how off the charts we are here, right? Um, James Franco did mo make a movie of Child of God, which I have not had the heart to watch because it's just too painful. My relationship with James Franco and Cormac McCarthy cannot bear that particular triangulation. Um, but, but that said, uh, and how bad that movie must be, but um, that said, um, these are movies that defy description um, and defy um, any kind of moralizing. Now, you could argue there's a turn in McCarthy and that with, uh, with after Sutri, after he got Sutri out of his system and there's something weird going on morally in Sutri, and that at that point when he turns to the Border Trilogy that he's thinking more explicitly about what the m storytelling does as a moral and religious act. I think that's totally a plausible read and I totally accept, agree with Matt on that. And yet I wonder if we can read the early novels retroactively through that. And one line that just really stuck with me as I was reading um, uh, Matt, uh, Matt's book was his citation of a moment again from the Border Trilogies. Um, when um, Duena Alfonso, the great aunt of John Grady's romantic interest, uh, Alejandra tells him, quote, the question, um, and I didn't go look it up to get what the ellipsis was, because I trust you, that wasn't important. Um, and I could end the book, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, again, uh, the question was always whether that shape we see in our lives was there from the beginning, or whether those random events are only called a pattern after the fact, okay? Was the shape we see in our lives there from the beginning, or were these random events that we call a pattern, only a pattern after the fact. And you go on, Matt goes on in the book to answer what he, to, to see what, to put forward what he sees as McCarthy's answer, um, which is a double answer. On the one hand, you have um, a moment in, um, shoot, I lost, I lost my spot here. Um, you have a moment where it appears to be that the answer is the pattern's there from the beginning. And yet, you see McCarthy is ultimately rejecting that. You're saying, no, the pattern can't be there from the beginning. The pattern is what we put into it, right? Um, it's what we practice, and that's why that line from the boy, it's, you know, the father says to the boy, or the man says to the boy, you have to practice talking to me. You have to practice hearing me talk back to you. It's not gonna just happen. You have to imagine my voice and you have to keep talking to me, and that act of memory and practice and repetition is what's gonna make my voice lie to you. Um, so that in that sense, the boy who's gonna remember his, his memory of his father, and they say he always remembered, is, is the retroactive creating of a pattern out of the story. Um, and the reason I, I point to that section and ask the, and, and, and the question it raises for me is the extent to which the McCarthy of the second half of his career, and you know, who knows how, like, he hasn't written a book in a while, um, but in, the McCarthy of, of the Border Trilogies to the, to the Road, to what extent that McCarthy is trying to give a different ending to the story, or trying to create an ending to a story that he starts to tell in Child of God, Outer Dark, Sutri, but that isn't in place in those, in those books. Um, and what that means and how we read his oeuvre across time. Um, one of the things that Matt does in the book is in the second chapter, um, first chapter, sorry, I'm being vague, um, you, you read, um, you read uh, No Country for Old Men alongside of Blood Meridian. And, and I keep feeling like, no, it doesn't quite work because Blood Meridian has no, you know, there is no moral in Blood Meridian. I think you're right about the Nietzschean character of Holden, et cetera. But the answers, insofar as they are answers, or the attempt to see goodness in human relations, that is clearly the case in um, No Country for Old Men, seems to be very close to absent in Blood Meridian. And so, you know, what does that mean about how we read somebody across their works, and especially somebody like McCarthy, who is constantly re uh, inscribing the, the imagery, the language, the forms of storytelling from earlier narratives into later ones. So that the language of Eucharist, you're right, it shoots all the way through the whole thing. The language of baptism, the sacramental language is, is runs all the way through. Uh, the images of crossing are run all the way through. And yet I'm not sure that the, the particular possibility of what I see as a kind of goodness in transience I'm not sure that that's in place until we get to 
to the, ch to the, to the um, cities of the plain. Um, there's also a more complicated question that, that I'm not going to you know, belabor here, but the cities of the plain. Such reends with him looking back on, um, uh, uh, has he been in Nashville? Where's he been? Knoxville. Knoxville. I knew I was in the wrong part of Tennessee. Um, uh, he, was, he looks back on Nosh, in Knoxville and he describes it as if it's Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Um, cities of the plain or Sodom and Gomorrah. The, the language of uh, you know, the road, the apocalyptic scenario of the, of the road is that everything's on fire and is either still on fire or, or is burning or will be, you know, or is, or is still, or has been burned, sorry. Um, and so, there's, there's a kind of implication of a certain notion of what the moral is in that use of the imagery of Sodom and Gomorrah that really troubles me. And I don't quite know what's going on with it. I don't know what he means by it. Um, I don't know what, what he means by the, by the embraced criminality of the characters that he encounters in Sutri. Um, and, and I don't know what he does with the fact, and this, for people who don't read, haven't read the novels, I apologize, but Sutri is about a guy who's a, who's, you know, a middle class, a middle class guy who's, who has, lives as a near homeless, lives on a houseboat or a, you know, a boat and you know, fishes catfish out and takes them to people, but he's slumming, right? I mean, he doesn't have to be living that way. Um, and so what's at stake in that, that posture of the one who's looking in on the transvestite, the prostitute, the criminal, um, and standing in a kind of pastoral relationship to them, yet one that, that he also is ambivalent about. Um, and then how do we think about that moment in Sutri, where Sutri leaves Knoxville, all his friends are dead or in jail, except for tripping through the dew who's still there. There are people still there. He still leaves. What's he leaving? And what's the moral arc of that departure? And does the moral arc of that departure have any role to play in the moral arc of the border trilogies, the road, no country for old men? Um, and I think that there's more ambivalence in McCarthy about this. Um, and the, the last thing I would say is I think that the, the um, protagonist of no country for old men, the um, sheriff, I think, he's, I think that the sheriff is a much more ambivalent character than perhaps on, uh, on your reading, I don't think he's 100% in the sheriff's corner because the sheriff has this romanticized vision that the West didn't used to be like this. This is by the man who wrote no Blood Meridian, right? The West was never a pick, you know, the West was always lawless and, 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 and full of evil. So what is that, you know, kind of cowboy sheriff figure doing in embracing a certain kind of heteronormativity as the site of the one piece of goodness between him and his wife I don't know where McCarthy is in that, like I said. Um, and I think he's, he's someplace that may be, I'm not saying you're engaged in orthopedic moralizing. It, the, the beauty of the book belies that, of your book belies that. But I do think there's a danger of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the searching for the good, losing or missing or, or over uh, undercutting the ultimately deeply tragic na nature of the novels. Um, again, I don't think you do it, but I think that the language of Eucharist and the language of sacrament could make people hear something else there, right? That is, one, at one time you used the word modest redemption, and I was just thinking, is that an oxymoron? Like, I don't know, you know? But that's, that's the question that I'm left with this time around. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Amy. And our second respondent is Professor Shelley Rambo, who is an associate professor of theology at the BU Boston University School of Theology. Uh, professor Rambo has a master's degree from Princeton Theological Seminary, another one from Yale University, and has her PhD in theology from Emory's uh, graduate school, graduate division of religion in 2004. Her teaching and research interests include feminist theory and theology, postmodern theology, pneumatology, and trauma studies. A constructive theologian, she engages the textual tradition of Christianity with particular attention to postmodern literary analysis and criticism. Trained as both a systematic and constructive theologian, she is interested in how classical themes in the Christian tradition interact with and inform contemporary discourses around suffering, trauma, and violence. 
through a series of faculty grants funded by the Center for Practical Theology and the Lilly Endowment. She has been developing and presenting workshops that offer religious leaders critical tools for thinking theologically about trauma. In this vein, her book, her 2010 book, Spirit and Trauma, A Theology of Remaining, forges a theology of the spirit through engagements with postmodern biblical hermeneutics, a theology of Holy Saturday, and contemporary trauma theory. Her current research includes explorations of the significance of resurrection wounds in the Christian tradition in connection to contemporary discourses about wounding, both in popular culture and the study of trauma. So let us welcome Shelley Rambo. Thank you. Um, I'm really happy that Amy went first, partly because the passages that she read um, will kind of come back in some of my reflections. Um, but also this question about the early McCarthy, the later McCarthy, um, the grim vision, the, the moral vision, um, I think will also um, emerge. So I'm thankful to, um, to Matt for um, inviting me into this conversation and for, um, for having me return to Cormac McCarthy. Um, who I've read uh, extensively and for reasons, um, of course, is up in question given what Amy said about him. But um, I, also, I also am thankful for the hours that I've spent recently in the underworld of the Tennessee River with, with Sutri. It was the, the one that I hadn't read. Um, available on audiobooks. And somehow... Oh, and they um, said Sutri? Yeah, Sutri. Oh, and somehow strangely appropriate for my Boston commute, moving <laughs> through multiple means of Boston public transportation. But I also want to say it's 20 hours on audiobooks. So I had no idea how long this novel was. It was like 20 hours. So I'm still um, moving through it. And I, it reminded me how, how much I love McCarthy, not because it's so grim, but because it's such beautiful writing. Um, and the, the kind of barren landscapes, the, the, the thick description. Um, so it was really good to hear it. So um, anyway, so I'm not done. I'm like on hour five. So um, I've really spent some time with Cormac McCarthy, but nothing comparable to the journey that, that you've been on. And I never had the idea that I would want to write a whole book on McCarthy, um, partly because, as you'll see, I have some, um, some questions um, about him. And um, so, as many of us are asking how we are oriented to a world in ruins, I see Potts's book as attempting to position us in relationship to our world. There's a timeliness to um, his uncertain ethics. I share with him a sense that McCarthy can be a helpful interlocutor, and particularly as an American writer, who shows the underbelly of an American narrative of redemption via through, through violence and the ravaging of land and persons. Land plays such a central um, role as a kind of character itself in, in McCarthy's novels. McCarthy's ashen landscapes rightly haunt us and can stir us, um, in us deep questions about identity. Potts positions McCarthy amidst his interpreters and then offers some insights about the positioning of the literary in relationship to religion within post-secular America. While I would like to hear Potts speak more about theology in the literary, I want to focus on the yield of bringing McCarthy to theology and the constructive theological vision that Potts is proposing, both a cruciform logic and an uncertain ethics. I want to... Um, so both of those two, I think, are central to, to the book. The first, um, he is the first to study the sacramental imagery within McCarthy's novels, and he aims to demonstrate that McCarthy's, this is a quote from him, demonstrate that McCarthy's routine and extensive use of sacramental imagery means to deploy precisely this cruciform logic towards the development of a distinctive moral vision of sacramental ethics. Those are your words coming back to you. <laughs> he positions us in the sacramental tradition of Christianity, although we could say a distinctively Protestant one. So he aims to show us a creative use of sacraments, a construct, make a constructive theological argument, and draw out this, 
the sacramental logic within McCarthy's work. So those three things are operating, creative use of sacraments, constructive theological argument, and then drawing out something in McCarthy's work. Sacraments, if they were going to matter or have meaning, he says, must involve themselves somehow in the risk and mystery of an uncertain ethics. They must, these are his words, um, they must echo with promise and forgiveness. They must stand vulnerable to chance and other monstrosities while yet remaining open to the future for which they may or may not provide the possible beginning. But what is of interest to me is this sacramental vantage point. Sacraments position us in a particular relationship to the world in which one sees in and through the ruins, redemption and hope. There is no alternative route as if to simply go around the ruins. So there's no kind of escaping. Instead, a sacramental vision is bold, risky, and rigorous. Martin Luther figures strongly in Potts's analysis, and I wonder to what extent Potts, to what extent Potts is calling us to simply live into Luther's theology of the cross, to contemplate the things of God through suffering in the cross. It's not surprising, given this vantage point, point, that Potts places us within the barren landscapes of McCarthy's novels. Hope and redemption, he says, remain only murmured hints on the pages of McCarthy's novels. An uncertain ethics must rise from the ashen. It's like a fabulous word that he uses throughout the road, ashen. ashen. I'd like to explore his sac constructive sacramental vision by focusing on his reading of the road the McCarthy book I reflected upon most deeply. I've been in an ongoing exchange with philosopher Richard Carney about trauma in Western literature, as he has recently been exploring how trauma travels and potentially transfigures in the works of Homer, Shakespeare, and Joyce. He invokes, like Potts, a sacramental vision, although we could say a decidedly Catholic, perhaps a Joycean one. I was taking note while reading Potts how they both how both of them appeal to narrative and stories and to ethics within the postmodern both follow a cruciform logic rendering a sacramental vision with a decidedly father son patterning it is this father son patterning that carries not only in western literature but in western christian theology when asked, ab asked about the road's deeper meaning mccarthy sim simply notes that it's a story about a father and a son. Um, and yet, it is a recognizable trope in Western literature, perhaps sealed by Eric Auerbach's infamous essay, Odysseus's Scar, in which the sacrifice of Isaac is juxtaposed with Telemachus's encounter with his father, Odysseus. Fathers and sons, terror and tenderness. The Abraham story transmits tra traditions sealed by sacrificial logic. In his final chapter, Sacrament, Potts claims that the tension of the tender and the terrifying can be held in a vision of God. Potts's moving vision of sacramental ethics culminates in the image of father and son given over dispossessed. He writes, quote, this is this great long paragraph, uh, 182, so you've got to read this. Uh, it's like everything's in that. I think you got like some momentum on the like, I'm just going to throw out my vision of a dis dispossession in God. So here it is. Dis dispossession is how God appears and who God is. This is what it means to be. It means to be given over as a story and to be realized in that Passover as a human. There's a fundamental vulnerability and dispossession at the very heart of God, he claims. This is expressed in a dispossessing and displaced Christology. McCarthy provides an image of this dispossession. He writes, or indeed we may understand what is at stake when the dying father whispers to his weeping son at the end of this sad book, you have my whole heart, you always did. It may not be surprising that I find the father-son patterning problematic. And the place or absence of mothers and daughters is something to be probed, both in McCarthy and in Christian theology. But, but I want to stay with the reading of McCarthy and question whether he displaces the father-son patterning, 
whether the father-son logic itself needs to be dispossessed. It structured a world not made right again. Is it enough for Christian theology simply to resurrect it again and again? And I'm going to focus on this image of we're carrying the fire, so I'm glad, um, I'm glad you read that section. Potts says that the justification that the man and boy give themselves for continuing their walk is that they're carrying the fire. The father has two guiding sta statements that he gives to his son to keep them moving on the road. This is one, we're carrying the fire, and the other is, we are the good guys. In the collapse of the known world, the father employs these verbal guides that have lost their rever referential power but are kept alive as a means of moving them forward. They provide mission and purpose for their journey. While Potts reads Carrying the Fire intimately, I read McCarthy's use of these two justifications as part of the pathos of the novel. They are remnants of an old world logic that not only is gone, but that might have been instrumental in leading to the world's collapse, the logic which brought down the world isn't in fact a version of we're the good guys and we're carrying the fire, the logic that undergirds American exceptionalism. So this is, this is the question of him as an American writer and mm -hmm. that commentary. Mm -hmm. These statements repeated throughout orient the boy to shield him from the cannibalistic logic of survival that now governs the landscape. But there's a pivotal sequence of encounters towards the end of the novel in which the son recognizes that the logic does not point to a world, that the father employs it, but that it do, does not carry meaning. The son registers dis dissonance, perhaps even betrayal. The two have reached the ocean. This is that, that moment where, like, this is supposed to be the end of the journey, and they're at the ocean. Um, the two have reached the ocean, which was to be the final site of promise, um, their end point, and they stand at water's edge. The ocean is not blue as the father had promised, but a gray squall line of ash. He could see the, this is McCarthy, he could see, the father could see the disappointment in his face. I'm sorry it's not blue, he said. That's okay, said the boy. I'd love to hear you talk about the word okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, okay. it's okay, it's used just, I don't know how many times throughout the novel. While they encounter many survivors along the way, um, one of the final encounters, they meet a thief who threatens to take away the few things that they have left. And in a reversal, the father takes all that the man has, leaving him there naked without means of survival. They continue to make their way, but the boy can't help but to look back. He can't leave the man behind. And as they move forward, he continues to refer back to the man and to his fate. And in that encounter, there's a fundamental break in the boy's belief that we are the good guys and perhaps that we carry the fire. It's reflected in this exchange with his father who detects, who the father detects the shift in his son. And this is the dialogue. The father says, you have to talk to me, he said. I'm talking. Are you sure? I'm talking now. Do you want me to tell you a story? No. Why not? The boy looked at him and looked away. Why not? Those stories are not true. They don't have to be true, they're stories. Yes, but in the stories we're always helping people and we don't help people. Then there's this really interesting thing about um, reality and fiction and stories that I'd love to hear you talk about. So the son is handed over a logic in ruins that he grows to use. It ties him to his father, but it no longer holds in the world around him. He recognizes it not for the truth that it holds, holds, but as a lie that enables survival. The father's actions can't be interpreted as good. Perhaps this is the logic by which the boy becomes a man. But the dissonance is important to read here. Interpretations of the road often fall back on the vision of love that lies in the logic of sacrifice that the father makes for his son. I'm not convinced that McCarthy is fortifying this logic as much as saying that it too cannot survive. The tenderness between the father and son is certainly emphasized here, and for many this is the point of the road in its entirety. Love survives, even wins out in the end. But that's also the Oprah Winfrey book club version of the road, 
that made even McCarthy uncomfortable when he did his interview with Winfrey. If you ever want to see the most uncomfortable <laughs> book club author interview, because she's sweeping it up into this, you know, she's got the narrative of redemption just oozing, and he's like looking at her like, I don't know what to say. So, um, how we read We're Carrying the Fire makes a difference, I think, in whether a cruciform logic can guide us any longer, about whether it's a logic to be carried forward. And this is where I diverge from Potts, in that I do not see a sacrificial logic as salvific, but rendered through McCarthy, perhaps even impossible to hold. Potts read, uh, uh, writes, carrying the fire, he, he reads it much more optimistically than I. And I think Christian theology is much more optimistically than I. Potts writes, the logic of the, this is a quote, the logic of the man's stubborn sacrificial pra promise to carry the fire for his son follows the logic of sacrament that I've described, a logic which likewise locates the sacred not behind or beyond the fallen world, but squarely in the world and in the midst of all its brokenness. McCarthy is pressing us further, I think. Is it sufficient to access the logic of dispossession within Christian theology? Or does McCarthy open us to a dispossession of Christian theology on a much larger scale? The sacramental images appear as remnants of a world not made right again. Given the genre of the road, is McCarthy presenting a cruciform logic as a logic that has already run its course? So is your uncertain ethics uncertain enough? Mm -hmm. This does not mean that I don't think Christian theology can persist, but that, but that it survives only if it can speak goodness through multiple lenses. And I think the cruciform logic is one. So I'm thinking one logic, but is it the logic? The sun grows increasingly silent as the novel goes on. Like he won't answer the father and that, and that um, kind of turns away. It feels very significant to me. So the sun grows increasingly silent and I wonder if we're invited, if we're invited into the silence to release the known in order for it to really rise again, to not know whether it will. Is this dying the pattern of the world in all it's becoming? Or does the breath of God pass through life and death in a rhythmic hum, regardless regarding? Thank you very much. So um, in a few minutes, we'll ask our three uh, participants to put their chairs up here and have an open conversation. But first, we always ask the author if he or she would like to respond to the respondents. So Matthew. So thank you both uh, for these comments. I have to be honest, I was worried um, about this part of the, <laughs> of the talk because um, I consider both um, of these people teachers, either director or indirect, and I was worried after this dressing down I wouldn't have much to say. Um, but I have so much to say. Uh, and so I'm going to just try to say one thing each, and then we maybe can get to it in questions. Um, which thing to say? Um, so in, in regard to, to Amy's uh, remarks, um, well, I'll, I'll actually say two things. The, the first is that I, the, the thing about the cities of the plain, I remember you said that at the end of my dissertation defense. I did. Amy, you did. <laughs> no, it's okay. And I, and I no, no, no. And I, I, I uh, did not, very deliberately did not address it in this book, in this origins, because the reviewers didn't ask me to. Um, because I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, I, I think it's uh, important, and I don't know. Um, so that's the one thing to say. The other thing to say, though, is about um, you know the scene with or the, the quote you pull from Duena Alfonso, where she says um, whether the the um, whether the pattern we see in the world is one we put there, which one which was there from the beginning. I think it's really interesting that you pulled that out, but also pulled out the thing with with Billy Parham at the end of the crossing. And for those of you who don't know McCarthy's work, I'm going to get in the weeds a little bit. So sorry, but I, Amy made me. Um, <laughs> So the, just before that encounter where, where Billy is talking about his, um, 
his brother that, he'll, that he hopes he'll see again, but he's not going to see again. And, and this, this kind woman, he's homeless. This kind woman's taken him in. And, and um, three pages before this, he stopped at a creek, um, um, and he drank water from a cup on a stob, just like thousands of others before him joined in sacrament, by the way. But anyway, so he's, he's, he's at this place, and he's homeless, and he just tells the kids stories all day, the kids in this ranch. And he just wakes up with nightmares, and this woman comes in to give him a drink of water. But before this happened, he was, on the, he was on the road. He was living homeless, and he saw a man who he thought was death. And this man came over to him, and he shared a cracker with him. And the guy says, you'd share a cracker with death? And he said, well, yeah. anyway. So then they talk, um, and this man starts to tell him about um, uh, this dream he had where he was trying to make a map, where he dreamed about a man who was trying to make a map of his own life before it happened, mm -hmm. trying to map the world, right? And in this scene, I wish I had the text with me now. Or it might be in there, actually. But in this scene, so he, he's just been through this thing, and he, he's this guy, this guy who tells him this dream, this, this other homeless man who tells him this dream, is, it's a dream within a dream within a dream, actually. And so you're not sure where the register of reality is or what the real is. But, but what's at stake is, is, is making a map, make, finding a pattern, right? Um, and then when he's with this woman, who I think's name is Betty, right? Um, uh, McCarthy says, we look at, we look at this guy, uh, Billy Parham, and this woman saying, I know who you are. He says, like, you don't know me. I don't know why you're so good to me. You don't know me. And she says, I know who you are, and I do know why I'm so good to you. Um, and then McCarthy has a description of his hands, and he says that they were, that, um, they were, that, um, there were ropey veins in his hand that bound his hands to his heart. And then he says, there was map enough for men, for men to read. There was... What does it say to me? There was, oh, hold on. Do you want me to say oh, yeah, I stopped reading, which I yeah, should okay. The ropey veins that bound them to his heart. There was map enough for men to read. There God plenty of signs and wonders to make a landscape. To, to make, make a, a world, world. right. Yeah. And so this anxiety, anxiety to find meaning anywhere else than in just this man's hands, his labor, his suffering, and how it's bound to his heart. I mean, I think, I think that your questions, your, your comments are still um, um, important ones, but I, I, I think that this is maybe my orthopedic moralizing. But what I want to read in that line about saying there was map enough, I, I think that enough is really crucial, right? Not more, enough. Just the ropey veins attaching the hand to the heart. There is God's plenty of signs and wonders. Not somewhere else, right? Just enough. So I, I think that's what he's doing. And that relates to some of the things that, I, that uh, you, you spoke about, Shelley. Um, and the, the short answer is I think I, I agree with you in, entirely. I, um, I, I don't think the father's one of the good guys. Uh, I think what's so troubling about, what troubles me so much about this novel, and I think you're right about the, the, the dynamic of father and son in this novel. Um, what's so troubling to me about this novel is because I also read it as a father, right? And that I, I'm persuaded by the end of the book, on the one hand, that the father is not one of the good guys, but his actions are so entirely sympathetic, <laughs> right, to me as a father. I think that's really what's so troubling about it. Um, and the notion of carrying the fire, so that's, that's w just one thing I'll say there. Um, the notion of carrying the fire, you know, what the, the way I read carrying the fire is as a reference to the Akedah, uh, to the near sacrifice of Isaac. Because, and this actually occurs at the end of, of No Country for Old Men as well, when Ed Tom Bell has a dream of his father going up into the mountains ahead of him. Um, um, in, in the 22nd chapter of Genesis, it says that, that while... Um, while they ascended the mountain to make the sacrifice, Mount Moriah to make the sacrifice, uh, uh, Isaac carried the kindling while Abraham carried the fire for the sacrifice, right? And I think that I think that, that logic is inscribed in just the way um, the, just the way you say, Shelley. But I also wanted to see, and again, this is as a as a father, and I'm not trying to, to avoid that necessarily, but um, you know, I pull in this line from the poet Kathleen Norris, who talks about um, she says, you know, you've read this, right? That that um, just to give life to another human is to also guarantee a death, and and the 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 uh, the kind of the I think that I said this in class once, but it's, right, it's kind of like Spinal Tap. Uh, the, the 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 road is like this problem, this problem of guaranteeing a death for your beloved, which every parent goes through with their child is turned up to 11 in this novel, <laughs> right? Like the death is guaranteed, the death is guaranteed. But the, the dilemma is the same whether you're a, you know, a, an upper middle class 
um, person in America or in this place, the death is guaranteed. The death is real, right? And the question McCarthy, I think, is asking, and I, it remains to be seen how well I've argued it, but the question he's asking, I think, is, um, is if that, if that death is guaranteed, is there still value in, in right? Does the, death, does the death overcome the value of what's between? And I think that's why, I think he's saying yes, I think McCarthy's saying yes, and I think that he, he argues in kind of, or he shows in, in complicated ways why the father has betrayed that. But I also think it's why, although for much of the book I say theology of the cross, Luther, I think the road actually, and I have to actually thank a different teacher, Charlie Stang, for this, um, from my dissertation, but that in many ways the road um, presses back against a, a too rigid a theology of the cross. You know, Luther says that God can only be found in suffering the cross, but, but I think what the road tells us is that the meaning of this life, this man and this boy together, is not just whether or not they'll die, but the things they do together, which is sometimes share a can of Coke or go have swimming lessons in a pond, right? That these things are valuable. I, I think the thing that Charlie said to me when I was talking about theology of the cross, theology of the cross, Charlie said, but Jesus did more than die, right? He ate, he ate with his friends and he did other things, right? And, and we can take, take with full seriousness the reality of the death, even, the, even a, a fully dispossessed or a, a death where the redemption isn't even modest, right? Um, we can take that with full seriousness without diminishing the the importance and holiness of those meals and those swimming lessons and so forth. So that's all I'll say for now. Should we pull up chairs, Frank? Is that what we do? Yeah, if you yeah. can pull okay. your chairs up front here, then um, people can talk to you. I'll move Thanks. out of the way. simply to Matt or open it all free and we'll stop by seven at the latest. That's the only thing. <laughs> That's the rule. So, <laughs> yes. The floor is open. And I guess Matt, you want do to I do it? it? Okay. Yes. 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 Yeah. 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 Sorry to be the man who goes first. But um, <laughs> Matt, what did you learn about being a priest by writing this book? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Subtle, Catherine. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, I mean, that's a. Um, <laughs> I can tell yeah. you what Matt learned. <laughs> 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 I guess I'm, I'm wondering how, to, how like, sort of personal to make this answer. I guess I'll make it personal. Yeah, um, and because I, I don't want to feel like I'm manipulating the story or something. But uh, you know, I, I, Ron Peeman was my advisor writing this book, right? And uh, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer when I started this book. And um, again, and I, I'm not trying to exp you know use this story somehow, but I'm just trying to answer your question, right? Um, you know what? He called me this summer when I was just starting to write, um, and uh, his pastor of his local church had left, his Lutheran church. That's where a lot of my sacramental of theology comes from. Uh, his pastor just left, and so he asked me to bring him communion from from um, from my church uh, every other week. Uh, for the fall semester until he died, and um, and uh, and it, this is probably not obvious to others who read the book, but for me, as I read the book, you know, we, we tended not to talk about this book that much when we met, but the, the just the 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 experience of taking communion for this dying man, um, and uh, where there where we knew what the end was, we knew what was going to happen, right? There was no mystery. And um, uh, and just and just having that experience of taking communion, I think um, the further away I get from the book, the more I recognize how that experience has informed maybe some of my readings of the book. Um, and I think that informs the way I still. Um, I think it informs the way I still practice uh, my ministry, and it certainly informs the way I experience. You know, most of my life as a priest now is. Is, is Sunday morning. It's not the hospital visits and that kind of thing. Um, but it, it makes me, ex as a priest, it makes me experience that liturgy in a different way. I mean, I, even though I've been trying to push back against this reference and all this stuff, like what refers to what refers to what? I, there's a different experience. To be 
behind the altar with you know smells and bells and song and expensive vestments. Um, but to think that the meaning of that ritual derives its reality from a really sad living room with a dying man is just sort of changes the experience, and it has changed the experience. You know. Dan? Yeah, um, listening to um, Amy's response in particular, it seemed like a lot of the places where you disagree, you know, oh, in the terms early stuff. of whether you can read the whole arc of McCarthy's yeah. work are in a sense providential questions, questions mm -hmm. about whether you can find a, a sweeping meaning in history. Yeah. And I wonder if your emphasis on sacrament allows you to avoid that. In other words, it, can there be sacramental claims that are so modest that you're actually not making a providential claim? Or would you actually want to yeah. make the sort mm -hmm. of sweeping providential yeah. claim? I, I hope there is, because I think that is what I'm trying to do. Yeah, I think you are too. Yeah. I, think, I think I'm trying to avoid those providential claims, okay. uh, but still make an argument for, right? I, I forgot to, oh, sorry. No, 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 you go. No, why don't we ask, because I want to speak about the early books just for a minute, so why don't you? Well, oh, no, all I was going to say is that it, it, in trying to read the early books and later the light books, late books, it creates the feeling of a providential arc across yeah. his work that I don't think is there, yeah, yeah. even though I know that's not what you want from, I think you want to go yeah. with sacramental precisely not to. Yeah, anyway, yeah. Okay. So I, know, I, I think that if I could, if I, um, one, of the things I maybe, one of the things I maybe should have done in revising it is to maybe do a chapter on some of the early works to, so I could write, tease it out more, because I think that there's, um, I don't want to, right, I mean, I, I think that we just might have different readings about the, for, of these books, but I, I think that the, the, what has changed in between the earlier works and the later works, at least on my reading, is, is not, um, uh, for lack of a better phrase, the moral of the story, mm -hmm. um, but the, the degree of tragedy, mm -hmm. right? Because I think that in the, in, I, I'm convinced that in Blood Meridian that, that the kid is this tragic figure, and there is this articulation of the value of, something like promise or forgiveness, even though it might be an act which and which leads to, which is not providential, right? I think that, especially in the scene where the where the kid is killed by the, the, the judge, I think, or actually in the scene before the kid is killed by the judge, when he kills himself, mm -hmm. when he kills his doppelganger, mm -hmm. in a moment when, the, when the moment where there's an opportunity for forgiveness, when he eschews it, eschews it or whatever. Um, so I think it's there, and I also think it's elsewhere. I think that, that in Child of God, I think that that there, are, that there, are, there. It's harder. There's moments that the orchard keeper I don't like very much, so I just ignore it. Um, <laughs> the child of God, and in Outer Dark, I think it's absolutely that it's 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 uh, Cullo's refusal to, to take responsibility, to claim responsibility for the child that he's fathered with his sister, yeah. that leads him into this tragic hellscape. Right, yeah, and I think I that there, there is a, and so I think there he's just focusing upon how the how. I mean, I think there is. I mean, this is more orthopedic moral. No, no, again, no, right? no, 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 no. I think yeah. the different. I think I think there's a flipping out here. I okay. don't think that I don't think that McCarthy as an author doesn't have a intense condemnation of evil from yeah, first yeah. novel to last. Yeah, yeah, okay. I totally think that. Yeah. I just don't think he has a picture of the good. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. before a certain <clears throat> moment, I mean, it, you yeah. know, it seems to me that the early novels are 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 yeah. are, are high moralizing in the Jerry yeah, Miatic sure. mode. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. But I don't. I don't, and this is where the road, again, I come back to the end of the road, where I'm like, okay, on the one hand, the father doesn't kill the son, so in some sense, he doesn't fulfill the, yeah. the, the Isaac story. You know, he, does, he, he refuses to fulfill that story, and yet, even that act of what would seem to be a refusal of the father sacrificing the son, a refusal of Christianity, a certain Christian narrative, is itself presented as a tragic choice. Yeah. The child wants to go with him, the child wants to die. So, so, that, there, so that I think that at the yeah. end of, you know, and the only thing you have is the child's inner dialogue imagining his father speaking to him and him speaking to his father. It's something, yeah. Yeah. but it's, yeah, yeah, that's right. you know, so that, yeah. that's, that's all. Yeah. I, I really want you to talk about the mother. Yeah, well, um, that's another whole other yeah. issue. Yeah. And, and I think a thing that we didn't come to, which you end the book with, is like, how do you interpret the final paragraph, which is, of yeah. course, right. the big, yeah. you know, the, the maps and mazes of a world not made right again. Yeah. Right, um, right. And a world that's going to be gone. Right. You, humans yeah, are going to be gone. And from. whether or not yeah. the, the, um, the fact that he's taken up by the mother and, 
you know, the woman and the man isn't like he's going to be eaten. Yeah. Right? So, so a lot of people read that as like, oh, he's saved. And I'm thinking, no, he's maybe, the young boy may be food for the next, I don't know. That's not a novel reading, but this question of the fate of the boy right. is not, you know. Um, yeah, it's not secure. Secure. Yeah. Um, but it's but the secure. mother, is the mother, is, is the mother the one that actually um, morally, I don't know, if you think about is she yeah. the one who actually is the moral agent and the father not? I just want to have you talk about yeah. that because I, I do think the fact yeah. that you have a woman at the end who t talks about the breath of, you know, the breath of God. I, th I read the breath of God and the hum of mystery as maybe an assertion about nature that continues mm -hmm. no matter what patterning we put on it, which I think the Christian theology patterning father and son too kind of is one pattern that we put on the world and in the end it, it, it can't survive. Yeah. Um, but I want to hear you talk about the last sure. paragraph. Sure. And also the, the women in his novels. Um, I can't believe I love reading all of his novels <laughs> when there's such an erasure of, yeah. um, of that dimension. Of yeah. Uh, so, so I'll say a couple things, I guess. Uh, the other thing is I think I would write more about the mother. Because there's some things that in teaching this, class, in this book that wrote for a couple of years, I think I've come to some understandings of, of her and also of the father that I didn't, that students here helped me realize. Mm -hmm. um, so that when they had this argument between father and, and mother, or man and woman, right? Yeah. This right. language is, right. they actually don't use right. the language of father and right. son and mother, between man and woman, um, in, in where she's talking about her resoluteness to, um, to commit suicide. And she says, I take him with you, me, if it weren't for you. Um, uh, but then the scene immediately flips to the memory of the birth. Mm -hmm. And I think I misread that in this book. I figured it out after it went to press. <laughs> I think I misread that in this book. Because I read it as, oh, look, death and birth together. Huh? Like all these, right? And I think that's too simple. Because, yeah. because, because there's a line, and this was through conversation with students, students having taught the class, where he, he, the baby is born, the boy is born, and the father holds the baby up. I said this in class, Lion King style, right? Yeah, yeah, Elevates yeah. him above the ruins, right? Um, and then it says, her cries meant nothing to him. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. where in the in the moment that this child was born, the rest of humanity just kind of falls away. Everything like disappears. She becomes right. Yep. Everything else disappears, and and it's it's this kind of, um, and I think that I, for that reason, I don't trust his perception, his memory of the of the mother, right. um, or his perception of the world around him. Right. Um, and I think that there are clues in the novel that this family has been following them, and they're scared of this guy. Mm. <laughs> right. Right. No, the and family's then, totally. That's right. And yeah. that yeah. and that there are clues that there are other people who are trying not to live like a cannibal. Yeah. Like the guy who was not passing the comedy. Exactly. And I think that the, the, the father's not the good guy. He's the bad guy. Yeah. And that, they're all scared of him. Yes, they're all scared of him. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe even the son is scared of him, right? Yep. Um, and scared of what they will, he will make them do in order to protect the, the son. I think there's, you know, there's some readings of the, you know, I think that the difficult readings in the novel, I think, other critics who have read this novel see this love between father and son in the way you describe. And I think that's exactly the problem mm -hmm. in this novel because mm -hmm. the father has so made an idol of of the child that he cannot uh, he cannot hear the moral claims mm -hmm. of any mm -hmm. other people in the world mm -hmm. around him, right? He's so desperate to save the child from a death, which is already given, mm -hmm. that he will cause death to others like mm -hmm. them, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that this voice of the mother, which is filtered through the memories of, I think, this, this father who cannot cannot perceive anything else other than his the warrant that he has to protect this child mm -hmm. against all things, I think that I think there's a hint there of, of the fact that he's not one of the good guys anymore. And that's the other thing about, I mean, I, I wanted to say... There are no good guys there. I mean, that's said as if there are the possibilities that's right, yeah. for good guys in yeah. this world. And, I mean, there's if, if good yeah. guys and bad guys means cannibals and not cannibals, then he's not a... Right. Then he is a good guy. Right. No, that's right. right? Yeah. So, that's you know, true. so how, yeah, do we, how do we parse right. what yeah, good right. would mean? Yeah, I, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think. Yeah. I mean, I think the good here would... I mean, it, In terms of yeah. the story he's been telling the kid, yes. which are about... That's what right. does he call on heroism and justice? Old stories right. of yeah. heroism right. and justice. Yeah. Yeah. In those terms, right. he's not a good guy. And, and that, I think that scene that you point to, Shelley, is really great because he, because there's what happens is they have he's what's happened. He's just shot a, somebody who tried to kill him with a flare, mm -hmm. right? And they go up and there's this man and the woman and the guy's leg is all damaged and and the father's trying to explain to his son, this is why I had to do this, this is why I had to do this, and the son will talk to him and he says the old old stories aren't true, right? Yeah. Um, and he says, you, why don't you tell me? I won't tell you a story. Why don't you tell me a story? Tell me a story, right? 
And then there's a gap, and then we, res we return to the action, and we are able to discern that, that they have told each other stories. In the interim, we just didn't hear the stories, and that, and that the father was honest about, about the fact that he was dying with the son, right? And that, so one of the things I think that's happening there, I don't want to get too far afield from your question, your question, mm -hmm. Shelley, but I think one of the things that McCarthy's doing here is there is this sense, especially in a certain kind, in the way that storytelling or narratives apply to ethics and Christian ethics, is that stories are carriers of these eternal truths that we can just like, the stories are packages and we open them up and now we know the story, we know, right? And actually I think he's yeah. thinking about storytelling in a way that, that where stories do not reveal fixed truths but actually destabilize us with relation to one another and make us vulnerable to one another and that the, res the boy's refusal of the father's stories which follow this kind of model of a certain yeah. kind of narrative ethics um, opens up the possibility for a different kind of Ethics, which is based in storytelling, as vulnerability, as mm -hmm. openness, mm -hmm. as, yeah, so and as imagination, and as imagination. Yeah. That's right. That's which right. Which is part of and part also, of it. yeah, and also that they can be honest with each other about, I'm dying, right? Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. and the boy said they said that they, they talk about how sometimes they cry when they the other didn't know, and right, right? Like right, they're right, able to right. be open to each other in a way that we aren't mm -hmm. otherwise. And so I think that one of the things about the novel is it's precisely because he's his protectiveness is so sympathetic, at least in the text, at least for me, that. Um, I, I, I mean, I think, I mean, I'm sorry, we should let other people ask yeah, questions. Yeah, but no, that, that, <laughs> I just don't that. think the father's a bad guy. I think that's, the that's father, the I, mean, right. I mean, I think just, you know, he's not one of the good guys in the, in the context of the kinds of stories that used to get yeah. told. He's also trying to protect his son yeah, yeah, and right. keep his son alive. Yeah, and, right. and, and he, you know, and the only way he can keep his son alive is through the kinds of actions in which he engages. Right. And so I think that to try to try to morally resolve the character of the man is precisely mm -hmm. to um, refuse the ambiguity of storytelling and the reason for yeah, telling right. this story in narrative form yeah, rather than right. as a sort of yeah. analytic argument about what constitutes yeah, goodness right. or badness, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, and, so that, and so that I'm worried about anything that wants to say that the father, it's the man, good is yeah, good or bad, yeah. right? But that yeah. helps the sacramental argument, I mean, the, the, the creative use of sacraments, right, is to say that the tender and the terrifying are both there, and that, that yeah. somehow it's through that juxtaposition that sacraments um, do the work that you want them yeah. to do, a kind of uncertain ethics. So not going to the stock moral, moralizing of, when he destabilize, destabilizes us from that, then you have this very interesting, what I'm calling it, your sacramental vantage point, which yeah. is what we're, I'm thinking about how that would be practiced differently, right? Because as a practitioner, as someone who draws someone into the sacraments, what are you hoping happens? Some sort of destabilization that we see something revealed. I'm yeah. thinking, I'm bridging your, your minister, yeah, <laughs> yeah. theologian thing, is that the question of destabilizing in order to kind of hold this, this tension between terror and tenderness that comes up again and again yeah. in this book. So. Yeah. Charlie had a question. I just want you to answer Shelley's question. Tell us about the final paragraph. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of that points back to Dan's question about about um, uh, providence. Yeah, providence, like resisting or refusing providence, right? So, um, I, I I should have brought the, that book. I should have no, I, the, the road. I mean, oh, I, I, I have should, it. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've all, we've all I was going to say, you need to look at the last paragraph with Robert. I, I, I told the class this year that, so uh, there's a line, my favorite line from this book is, all things of grace and beauty such as one holds them to one's heart have a common providence in pain, their birth in grief and ashes. So the father whispered to the sleeping boy, I have you. Uh, and that's my, and I told my class this year that, that that's my religion on Facebook. So that's, how, that's, how, that's how crazy I am about this book. Um, <laughs> So the, the final paragraph, I'll just read it. Once there were brook trout in the streams and the mountains, you could see them standing in the amber current where the white edges of their fins wimpled softly in the flow. They smelled of moss in your hand, polished and muscular and torsional. On their backs were vermiculate patterns of the map. On their backs were vermiculate patterns that were maps of the world and its becoming. Maps and mazes of a thing which could not be put back, not be made right again. In the deep glens where they lived, all things were older than man and they hummed of mystery. Which is like, I, 
a huge departure from the tone of the rest of the book. That's I mean, right. the, the language occasionally has these flourishes of language, but it's all it's very it's a very different. I mean, this is almost like pastoral sort of um, prose about the natural world, which is mm -hmm. which which is in the past tense here, mm -hmm. right? Um, he says when they go to the water, there won't yeah, be there are no be, fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so I think that, and I think we need to take. And when I talked to Ron about this book, he's like, you need to deal with the not be made right again, not be put back, mm -hmm. right? And um, and uh, I don't think I would deal with it in a way that Ron would approve of. Uh, <laughs> but I I think I deal with it. Um, I mean, I think it's it's just this. I I think that the the renunciation of the providential sense that that it does end and that, that maybe it, that there that there that it ends. Um, um, doesn't diminish the beauty of the of, of what comes before, right? And I think that's a, was especially important. I don't know if you're trying to get this out of me, Charlie, but I think what's especially important is the images of fish, which, and this is maybe too assertive a reading, but you know, I mean, he could have McCarthy could have picked any woodland creature for this this final <laughs> paragraph, right? And that he that what to my reading, on my reading, he, that he chooses this um, this Christological sign. Of the fish, right, and that the and that the maps that are written on the body of this fish, this living fish, which is muscular and torsional, which are beautiful Latinate words, right, um, is vermiculate, and and vermiculate uh, means wormy. Mm -hmm. um, so my dad's a fly fisherman, and you get a brook trout, and it's got little wormy patterns on its back, mm -hmm. right. Uh, but it can also mean worm eaten, like corpses are vermiculate mm -hmm. too, and so like the, and I think this is pointing back to the thing that death is written on the body of life, like in birth, right? It mm -hmm. comes with it, right? Mm -hmm. And and I think whether or not this is a satisfactory answer for for Ron Thiemann or the Christian Church or my bishop or whatever is a different question. But I think <laughs> McCarthy's answer to this question is is mm -hmm. to to say to take with full seriousness that it ends, but also to assert through the beauty of his language that look at the beauty of this dying thing and the, the, the kind of value of a dying thing. And, that it, and not only is it a over. A thing, yeah. Well, and yeah, not yeah. only was it over, there was once a time when it was not. That, yeah, that's right. Right? That's so right. The, 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 in the deep lands yeah. where they live, excuse me, in the deep lands where they lived, all things were older than man, and they hummed of mystery. So it's the olderness as well as yeah. the, yeah, that's right. as yeah. well as the finiteness yeah. at the end. Yeah. I think the baptism scene is even more baptismal than you get. Ghostly, pale, and shivering, the voice of Finn, it stopped his heart. He dove headlong and came up gasping and turned to it, stood, beating his arms. Is it over my head, the boy called. I mean, the, the ghostly dove oh, yeah, yeah. and the uh, over my head. Yeah. I mean, it's totally, you know, it's like, you know, like, I was like, sorry, we, this is totally the Baptist. This is totally the Baptist and Jesus. Do you know what I mean? And so, and so, and, and McCarthy's not an idiot, you yeah. know? I mean, this is, um, and so, so when we get to vermiculate fish, yeah. like all of those things give more and more weight yeah. to the. Yeah, even the language in that of the mm -hmm. final paragraph, right? Yeah. Like the, just the, the tone of it, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. That, like, yeah. The shift towards this really, yeah. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. The cadences of it, yeah. Yes. Um, I think it's sort of like a, I don't know that much about, about McCarthy, but sort of like a meta question about um, the uh, kind of like what it is that happens with someone who has a specialist training in the academic study of religion particularly in Christian theology, and applies that onto something which is ostensibly not Christian or ostensibly not religious or would otherwise not be studied in a religious studies context. Yeah. Um, and because I find myself having this experience all the time too, or if like I'm reading a novel or, or even if I'm reading um, secular philosophy, and I'm like, what, this is, a, this is a religious thing, like you're talking about a religious thing, or you're replicating a religious idea. Um, and so, and for me, there's something about, it's like there's something about, it's like you're in repeating this religious thing, or this Christian thing. You're giving it a kind of credence. You might be, or a kind of respect, or you're at least allowing it to continue, even if it, like, it's someone might say, Cormac McCarthy, like, well, it's repeating for the purpose of, like, parody, or travesty, or it's a repeating to, for the purpose of criticism. Um, but so I'm wondering, but, but I'm like, uh, you know, there's like you said, it's it's all over the place. And some of the examples that you read, it seems like, oh, it's sort of something more than that. 
so I have this, this question of like, so what is it, what is our responsibility as people who have specialists, specializations in uh, the, in interpreting the images that like the authors are inducing? Um, what, what can we bring that's unique to the table that maybe someone without this training couldn't? And what was your experience like writing a book where you have specialists like actually in sacramental theology writing about sacraments in an ostensibly secular work? Yeah, that's about. <laughs> 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 um, I mean, that's a really great question. Um, and I actually would like to hear uh, the term speak by as well. Uh, maybe first. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if this is a useful answer. And I, I, it's a useful answer. I don't know if it's a good answer. Right. So I, I'll tell you what I say to myself in my head as I'm trying to do this. Right. Um, and it's also why I have a, just you know a little bit of chagrin that this book is listed under literary studies versus mm -hmm. not theology, right? Um, because because um, I think even though like the, even though the genre of it and most if you're turning from page to page it looks like literary criticism, I think I don't know. I'll have to ask other readers what they think. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I'm doing theology. Mm -hmm. I feel like the. The theologian in the room is not Cormac McCarthy or even Rowan Williams or Augustine or Luther. Mm -hmm. It's me, mm -hmm. right? And what I'm doing is taking up how these images from the tradition, which different authors are deploying and, and manipulating in different ways, and I'm taking them up to try to construct my own argument yeah. about what the significance of the sacraments are. And it's one that I think McCarthy wouldn't probably go with all the way, and it's one that Luther and, and yeah. uh, Rowan Williams, uh, Peace Be Upon Him, wouldn't go all the way with. But um, but it, but I, I the way, only way I can sort it out when I try to do anything else, I get confused and I'm not sure what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I think I have to name myself as the person that's right, doing the constructive yeah. project. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know. I mean, that's just, and really that's just more of a, a, a writing practice. I don't know if I, I haven't really theorized that. I don't know mm -hmm. if I if I should maybe. But but in my head, I just think of this. That, and that way, I don't need to distinguish between whether a person is a Christian theologian writing within the discipline of theology. Or a, or a novelist, a last Catholic novelist, writing the discipline of literary fiction. I just have these texts, and I have my own kind of argument that I'm constructing. I mean, I, I did have that question. I mean, I had this whole excursus of, about thinking about methodology, thinking about, um, you had this kind of modern field of religion and literature, in which you would read religious themes and literature. And we had like departments and religious studies places that were religion and religion. Those, those are, so I'm trying to track those. Those are most mostly gone. And then you have the rise of critical theory. So this question about like how you read novels and how you read religion in novels is kind of complicated by critical theory. I've been trying to discern, so I was hoping like in this, this new moment, because I think one, there's a turn to the literary. Um, in tri I think a turn to thinking about the relationship between theology and the literary that's like a new wave, partly because I'm seeing students more interested in sourcing of theological ideas through, not through the kind of canon of authorized like figures, but that to, to read it through novels or so fiction. And so I'm trying to think about what that means for us, for for how you would guide future students in writing, or um, because often this was thought of as like side work, right? Even you you did like because I thought, oh, I'll write this cool piece about the Cormac McCarthy. That's what I did because I was like, I'm really obsessed with the road, so I might as well write an article about it. But it was never really the main. Thing of study, but I think it ra this raises really interesting questions about um, in a in the post secular or in the current moment that we're in, um, how much the kind of canon of figures in the Christian tradition, the people who you source here, whether they'll take the lead in how theology is written, is such a cool question. Whether who well, I don't know who's the they was there. The the kind of Luther and you know the the people who he's sourcing in terms of the canon either of like Western philosophy, this is also an interesting question about philosophy and the literary and theology and how they're positioned, but how the, this, the traditional sourcing for, let's say, Christian theology 
is changed by what you do? And, and or, I, or is it just kind of, I don't know, I think it's a really interesting field question. I mean, it can't just be a question about sources, though. It, all, it also has to be a question about writing and about form mm -hmm. and the forms in which we write and the modes in which right. we write. Yeah. And, and, um, and I think that, that one of the things that I think is so powerful about this book is that you allow yourself to do that theological thinking and, you, and to bring together you know, uh, Martin Luther, Judith Butler, and Cormac McCarthy. Then Judith Butler's really kicking, you know, like, wait a minute, like, I'm a Jew, I don't want to be stupid. You know, um, uh, and, and I'm kicking on her behalf. But at the same time, she, she does something powerful for you, and, and, um, and she works powerfully for your argument, right? So Brent, you know, there's, there's a little lot of people around. Like, but, but, but the fact that you know that, and the fact that you position yourself and say, look, I'm not claiming these people for X, Y, or Z. I'm deploying them towards a certain end. The question that I have, but it's an like ongoing question, I think not for this, but moving forward, is, OK, but wait a minute. You know, and this is maybe why I'm so vehement about the, the father, the, the man is not good or bad. It's like, you know, the novelistic form allows Cormac McCarthy not to decide the question of the goodness or, or, or evilness of the father, right? Um, uh, the typical form of theological treatise forces us to decide the question of the goodness or evil of the father. Um, and so how are we going to allow our modes of writing and engagement to be so affected by um, the by the literary, to use the you know, this sort of Dridian notion of the literary as opposed to the particular? Um, how are we going to let that undecidability come in radically? And I personally, this is just, I just had to say this. You were talking about the except, American exceptionalism. No, Shelley yeah. was talking about American exceptionalism. I was like, what about the Christian exceptionalism? Yeah, I mean, the right. language of sacrament, just like, you, you know this. Right. Matt and I have been through this for a while now. <laughs> makes me like want to just die. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, at least the Catholic schoolgirl in me is just not interested. But at the same time, you're pointing to something very, that I respond to very strongly. And so, and so I'm interested in, is there another language with which to talk yeah, about yeah. that? Even as you may want to talk about it as sacraments in order to transform things about Christianity from within, which I think is what your project is. So yeah. maybe my project is to find other language. But yeah. um, but but it seems to me it has to have to do. It has to it has to be not. We have to not just like turn to the ways people have been thinking theologically with literature all along, <coughs> but also with how that can transform the language with which we. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. do work in yeah, religion right. or theology or philosophy mm -hmm. or whatever it might be. We can yeah. only write novels about these novels. Right? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. And I think there's novels that are very bad kinds of articulations of this. And I don't think it just has to be about novels, but I do think we have to be willing to to try things that haven't been tried before. Yeah, I, yeah, I think I think that's right. Yeah, and I. Um, it's funny you say that because that's what I'm trying to do with this next book. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. Right. No, I, um, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, but I also think that that that, uh, that what I yeah I agree with what you say about the the, the refusal to this that that the theology wants to assign the goodness or badness and yeah, exactly yeah. what you're trying to deal with. If the argument book is correct, you should resist that, right? And then it demands a kind of new kind of writing. Um, but I also think, and this is where I I think that um, your your criticism or your worry also worries me because I do want to retain the language of sacrament and retain the right. symbology of the cross. Right. If everything I've said about this dispossessing this movement of displaced signs yeah. is true, then it, the, the, the end point of that trajectory is where those signs, right, are, where I need, maybe need to look a little bit, yeah, right? Yeah, and so, yeah, yeah. And, and I haven't, I don't know whether my, my um, commitment to holding on to them is, is, is one, a commitment that I am holding critically or right? mm -hmm. So. Well, sadly, uh, given yes. this wonderful yes. conversation that uh, is holding us riveted here, <laughs> um, as I said, the unviolable rule here is that at 7 we break up the formal sessions. You're welcome to stay around as long as you want to talk. Uh, I think we should just end the formal session with our gratitude to Matt yeah. and Amy and Joey. Yeah.